What's up guys? So in today's video, I'm gonna be breaking down my quarterback rankings for 2021. Now I'm gonna cover 24 guys total, but I'm gonna break it up into three videos with eight guys in each video. So this video is going to be ranks one through eight. That way I can really go in depth and spend a few minutes on each guy and get the whole picture. And there will be timestamps in the description. And not only am I gonna be ranking them, I'm also gonna be breaking them down into tiers. And tiers for quarterbacks are a little bit different than other positions, um, especially when you're talking about single quarterback leagues where you're not doing super flex, you're not doing two quarterback, just the most common rosters where you're only starting one guy and maybe you're only rostering one guy completely, like no quarterbacks on your bench. When it comes to these kind of tiers, you pretty much want to be shooting for who can be the QB1. Like, there's really not that much of a difference between the QB12 and the QB20 in these kind of leagues. So there's not much point of taking a guy. If he doesn't have upside to be the number one guy, he needs to be a really good value at where you're drafting him, or you might as well not even draft him at all. So I'm gonna to try to keep the tiers pretty simple where I have guys who I think are league winners potentially, and guys who their floor is just so safe that I think they're worth drafting where their ADP is right now, or sometimes even a little bit before. So with that being said, let's get into it with my first ranked quarterback, and that's Josh Allen. Now, Josh Allen actually just finished 2020 as the quarterback one. So believe it or not, the odds are not looking good for him to repeat that because there hasn't actually been a back-to-back -back QB1 performance since Dante Culpepper did it in 2003 and 2004. But with that being said, we have seen guys who have stayed up in that top tier elite level for a long time. Guys like I remember back in the day, Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers were pretty much going back and forth trading first and second places for what seemed like a decade. And I think we're just now starting to enter that kind of window with Josh Allen. And that's because he's a great bet to finish as the QB1, but he also has a really nice top five-ish floor. And that comes from the fact that in the modern day fantasy landscape, in order to finish as the QB1, you need to have high-end passing upside as well as high-end rushing upside. And Josh Allen had both of those in 2020. He was top five in basically every important passing stat, so completions, yardage, touchdowns, and in attempts he was sixth. In terms of his rushing, he was also in elite company. He was one of only four quarterbacks to run the ball at least 100 times, and he put up over 400 yards on the ground along with eight touchdowns, and he also caught one for a good measure. Now that Stefan Diggs is in town, the Bills have shifted to a really pass-heavy offense, and with the supporting cast of guys like Cole Beasley, Emmanuel Sanders, Dawson Knox, Gabe Davis, I think we can expect more of the same in 2021. When the Bills get into the red zone, all of the scoring goes through Allen. The Bills run game is pretty irrelevant, and Josh Allen serves as the team's goal line back in the same way that Cam Newton does for the Patriots. Speaking of Cam, Josh Allen is built almost exactly like him. They're both about 6'5", 240 pounds, they can both run like a gazelle or run through any defender. The thing is, Josh Allen can also throw for 4,500 yards and 40 touchdowns, which was basically his passing stat line in 2020. So Cam Newton's MVP season where he scored 45 total touchdowns, he was a league winner because he was being drafted in the double digit rounds and he ended up popping off and finishing as the QB1. Well, Josh Allen just did the exact same thing. He also scored 45 total touchdowns. He was also being drafted in the double digit rounds and he also finished as the QB1. And he, the only reason he didn't win MVP like Cam did is because Aaron Rodgers was going absolutely nuclear on the entire league. And this season, I actually think Allen has the potential to get even better, improve on some things and probably go out and win the MVP this time. Now he's not gonna take another massive jump like he did from 2019 to 2020, but there is one major improvement that I could see him making, and that's cutting down on his turnovers. He had 16 total turnovers in 2020, uh, 10 picks and six fumbles, and there were only six quarterbacks who had more than him. If he cleans that up, he's gonna have an even more monstrous season this time around. So with that mix of the high-end passing combined with his rushing upside and a huge frame to help him stay durable throughout the season and endure that workload, Josh Allen gets the edge as my quarterback one. Now number two on my list is gonna be Kyler Murray. And he and Josh Allen are both in the same tier where these guys could and probably will win you some leagues. But the main reason that I gave the edge to Josh Allen is that he's just so much bigger and so much more durable. Kyler is absolutely electric. And he also has that mix of high-end passing and high-end rushing. 
The only problem is, is that he's five foot 10, 200 pounds, and he's already suffered an injury that derailed what would have been a massive season. Now he made it through his rookie season healthy, but halfway through 2020, he sprained the AC joint in his throwing shoulder. And even though he didn't miss any games because of it, all of his stats across the board suffered. His passing stats dropped a bit, but more importantly, his rushing stats took a massive hit. His rushing attempts got cut by about a third, his rushing yards got cut completely in half, and he only scored one total rushing touchdown in the six games following the injury. Now that being said, he still finished as the QB3, and that's because the pace he was on before that injury was insane. He was set to be a league winner even with a really high ADP. A lot of experts had Kyler as their QB3 or QB4, which represented a really big jump in production from what he had done his rookie year, but he was actually making good on that up until the injury. He was on pace for 4,200 passing yards and about 30 touchdowns, which are both pretty solid numbers. But what was really game-breaking was his rushing pace, which was a 1,000-yard, 16-touchdown pace. If he had stayed healthy and kept that pace, he would have finished as the quarterback one by a huge margin, and in fact, it would have been the best fantasy finish by any player at any position of all time, and by a lot. The pace he was on was just stupid, and like I said, he still finishes the QB3 even with those depressed stats in the second half of the year. He has an even better supporting cast in 2021, with AJ Green, rookie Rondell Moore, and James Conner coming in to replace Larry Fitzgerald and Kenyon Drake. So he could have easily been my QB1 this season, but the main reason I gave it to Allen instead is because Kyler just isn't built like a tank the same way that Allen is. And if he keeps getting that really high rushing pace, it just increases the odds that he's gonna get injured again. He had 133 carries in 2020, but remember his stats took a hit. So if you take his early season pace, he was on track to have 150 carries throughout the year. That's a workload that a lot of starting running backs don't even get, and we know how hard it is for them to stay healthy, let alone a 5'10", 200 pound quarterback. So it's one of those live by the sword, die by the sword kind of things. That usage on the ground is what gives Kyler that game breaking factor, but it also brings with it some extra risk. So for that reason, I have him as my quarterback too. So those two guys make up my first tier, and that's the game breaking tier. Um, the next tier is, I don't have a name for it, it's just the Mahomes tier, because it's Patrick Mahomes. Now this might seem like blasphemy for some of you guys to have Mahomes down here at three, but you have to remember, we're not talking real life NFL football here, we're talking fantasy. And of course, he's the face of the league, he's the guy you pick first if you're starting a real team, but he just doesn't really have that super high upside to finish as the QB1 right now. Now most of that comes down to the fact that he just doesn't really have that high rushing upside that a lot of the other elite guys have. And that's not to say that he doesn't add to his value with his legs, he definitely does. But most of his runs, I'd say almost all of them, are improvised, and he's not really that much of a factor in terms of rushing touchdowns. In three seasons as a starter, he scored two touchdowns on the ground in all three of those seasons. Um, he averages about 55 carries for a little under 300 yards and 2020 was actually his best rushing season of his career with, I believe, 63 carries for a little bit over 300 yards and two scores. Now, that's not nothing. It's a nice little bonus to have, but I don't see him really increasing that aspect of his game. He's not gonna become a running quarterback. Um, he already had that knee dislocation, I believe, two years ago now, and the Chiefs sunk half a billion dollars investment into this guy, so they're not gonna turn him into a running quarterback and start risking him. Now that being said, his elite passing talent on the league's most high-powered offense is what keeps him in the conversation for being the safest bet at the position. His breakout season in 2018, he threw 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns. And while he hasn't been able to repeat that performance, he was actually on pace to put up similar numbers the year after, in 2019, until he suffered that knee dislocation. In 2020, he played behind a really, really compromised offensive line, and he was still able to finish as the quarterback four. Now that offensive line should be a lot better in 2021, since they went and traded for tackle Orlando Brown Jr., they signed guard Joe Thune, they drafted center Creed Humphrey, and Laurent Duvernay-Tardif is back after opting out of the 2020 season. Now this isn't Madden, where you just plug guys into your offensive line with higher overalls and now your line just plays better. Um, these guys do need time to practice together and develop as a cohesive unit. It's a real thing. And 
I wouldn't be surprised if the line starts out struggling a bit this year, but they should get stronger and stronger as the year goes on. And that's all there really is to say about Mahomes. He has the best tight end in the league in Kelsey. He has the most explosive receiver in the league in Tyreek. And he probably has the best offensive mind in the league with Andy Reid. So since that offensive line was pretty much the only negative mark against Mahomes this year, you can feel really safe about him finishing among the top quarterbacks. And while I wouldn't bet on him to finish as the QB1, I would never fault anyone for taking him at first off the board. He's just as safe a bet as there is to finish top five on the year, and he can also pop off at any time and win you a week. Now this next guy, when I think about it, I actually think he does belong in the tier with Mahomes in that he's really not gonna be a good bet to finish as the quarterback one, but he's just so safe that I feel like you could take him as the QB one off the board and people can't really be mad at you because he's gonna finish top five, and that's Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers is coming off of a season just a ridiculous season where he just went scorched earth on the whole league. Much like Mahomes, he doesn't really have the rushing upside to put him in that QB1 conversation, but his legs are definitely a nice bonus to his elite passing. I think this year we see another performance similar to last year's, but I will admit that it's going to be pretty hard for Rodgers to keep up that level of elite efficiency. Rodgers had a ridiculous touchdown to interception ratio, and it was at almost 10 to 1, which just does not happen in the league. In fact, it was the third highest ratio of all time over a full season, and the two guys ahead of him did it throwing way less touchdowns. So to me, 48 touchdowns to five picks, what Rodgers did, is way more impressive than 28 touchdowns to three picks, or 28 to two. Um, so we're probably talking about the best passing performance of all time. So no, it's not very likely that we see that type of efficiency again, but again, this is Aaron Rodgers we're talking about, and efficiency is his calling card. Out of the top nine touchdown to interception ratio seasons, Rodgers has five of them. Also, the guy is coming into this season with an even bigger chip on his shoulder, as he made it clear in the offseason that this is his last go-around with the Packers. I expect to see the best of Rodgers in 2021, and this year he actually comes in with one of the better supporting casts he's had in a while. Of course, Devontae Adams is still dominant as ever, but the Packers actually threw Rodgers a bone this time and brought Randall Cobb back to his old stomping grounds. And I don't think we should discount the special connection between an elite quarterback and one of their favorite receivers just because the receiver happens to be on the wrong side of 30. It's not quite Tom Brady, Antonio Brown, but it's pretty much the same idea. Also, Robert Tunyon represents a legitimate red zone threat at the tight end position, and of course Aaron Jones is just a dynamic pass catcher coming out of the backfield. So just those four alone are enough for Rodgers to work with, so the fact that he has like Alan Lazard and Marquez Valdez-Scanling, like those guys are just gravy at this point. Matt LaFleur has been getting a lot of grief over his questionable play calling in the playoffs, but to be fair, LaFleur and his handpick offensive coordinator, they've been really good at scheming up plays for the Packers' best players. And there's not really much else to say. Um, Rodgers is still elite, the offensive line is still solid, the defense is still not good enough that they're going to win the Packers any games, so I expect Rodgers to have to shoulder the load and deliver another top fantasy finish. He probably won't finish as the QB1 because he just doesn't rush for that many yards or touchdowns, but he's up there with Mahomes in terms of being one of the safest bets to finish in the top five. Now number five on my rankings represents a start of a new tier, and this one is not very safe like the last tier. Um, it does have a lot of upside in it, but at the same time, there's a lot of variability. And number five on my list is Dak Prescott. Now Dak Prescott's play style puts him closer to that tier of Josh Allen and Kyler Murray, where he has that really high end passing and a good amount of rushing. But the reason that I have him below the safe guys like Mahomes and Rodgers is because his rushing numbers really aren't enough to offset just how safe those two guys are and also the fact that he has some injury concerns. I'm sure everybody remembers his really gruesome ankle injury that ended a really promising 2020, and coming into 2021, he's been dealing with some kind of shoulder injury, and there's been mixed signals as to how serious it might be. Assuming that Dak will have a healthy 2021, he does actually have some of the highest upside of any quarterback. Now, it's really hard to take a tiny four and a half game sample size and extrapolate that across 16 games because that's just so much unknown to fill in the blanks and assume what might have happened. 
but for what it's worth, Dak Prescott's start to 2020 had him on a pace to put up the greatest fantasy season of all time. We're talking 6,000 yards, 30 touchdowns through the air, 300 yards, 10 touchdowns on the ground. It's not quite the same kind of season that Kyler Murray was on pace for, but it was still absolutely ridiculous and it would have been league winning had he been able to actually do it. However, I just can't say that he actually would have gone and done it, and the numbers are definitely a little bit skewed based on it being such a small sample size. So, for example, he was on pace to rush for 10 touchdowns on the ground, right? Well, if you look at what he actually did in those games, four out of the five games, he had a total of zero touchdowns, but he had three that came all in one week, and it was in a week two barn burner against the Falcons between what we now know were two of the worst defenses in the league, and they put up like 80 combined points in that game. But he was on pace for 10 touchdowns on the ground just because of that. So there's, there's just not much that we can do to reasonably guess what would have happened if he had stayed healthy, but I will say that the signs are definitely positive. The Cowboys' offensive firepower mixed with the defense really struggling was leading to Dak throwing for a ton of yards, and in 2021 his supporting cast should be even better. C.D. Lamb is the bell of the ball in the fantasy community right now, and with a really outstanding rookie season under his belt, he figures to take a pretty big step forward in 2021. Amari Cooper underwent surgery on his leg in January um, to try to clear up some of the issues he'd been having with that leg, and hopefully that can help him stay healthy and avoid the nagging injuries that he was dealing with in that area in 2020. Tight end Blake Jarwin is back um, after missing almost all of 2020, tearing his ACL, I believe, in the first or second week of the year. Um, so as he works his way back into the offense, he's going to bring some explosiveness at the position. And the offensive line will be reinforced with the return of Tyron Smith and Lyle Collins, both of whom were shut down early in 2020 with major injuries. In terms of the Cowboys defense, there are some new faces coming into the mix, with the Cowboys signing DeMonte Casey, uh, Keanu Neal, Malik Hooker, and drafting Micah Parsons at middle linebacker. So the arrow is definitely pointing up. But we're still talking about a defense that was bottom of the barrel in 2020, so even if they make improvements, they're still not going to be a good defense. I fully expect Dak to be forced to score a lot to keep the Cowboys in games, and I also expect a bit of a bounce back season for Ezekiel Elliott, so this offense as a whole should be humming. In terms of Dak's rushing, um, his output is definitely significant, but at the same time I think it's also a little bit overblown. So in his four full seasons, uh, Dak's rushing attempts are 57, 57, 75, and 52. Um, he always hovers around 300 yards rushing, and touchdowns, he's finished with six, 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 and three. Now that's not nothing, that's definitely added value to his production, but I think people see how mobile he is as a passer, combined with his knack for like scrambling for red zone touchdowns, and they kind of label Dak as a Russian quarterback. He's really not, but he's super athletic and really opportunistic, and he's shown that he can consistently bring that nice rushing boost to his production. Now there's definitely some variability in terms of where Dak might finish this season, but based off of the tiny sample we saw from 2020, he at least has a small chance of popping off and having one of those game-breaking type seasons in 2021, even if it's not very likely. And he also has a nice floor that comes from his team situation, his supporting cast, and his rushing upside. So Dak was actually in his own tier, because while he does have that upside with the high-end passing and the high-end rushing, it's just really hard to put him above the two super safe guys of Mahomes and Rodgers. Um, but my next guy, he is also one of the safest bets to finish among the top guys, and that's Tom Brady. So for Tom Brady, the formula is pretty simple. You take one of the best passers of all time, you pair him with an elite cast of pass catching options, and you throw the ball a ton. And the fantasy points just come rolling in. Now the Bucks in 2020 were definitively a passing offense. They had the third highest pass to run ratio in the league. Brady attempted the second most passes. He completed the second most passes. He threw for the third most yards, and he threw for the second most touchdowns. The running game was mostly irrelevant in this offense, and all the signs are pointing to that being the case again in 2021. The entire Bucks offense is returning to defend their title, and it should actually be better in terms of the pass catchers this time around. 
Chris Godwin was dealing with a bunch of nagging injuries all through 2020, and he has a clean bill of health coming into this season. Antonio Brown has had a full offseason to work with Brady and develop more chemistry, and he should be way more involved than he was when he was just joining the team. The tight end core is on the upswing as well, as Rob Gronkowski now has a full season in the books after he came off of his really brief retirement. And even though he's well past his prime, he was already showing signs of at least coming back slightly towards old form towards the end of the year and definitely in the playoffs. Also, I should note that tight end OJ Howard is returning to the team, although he's coming off of a torn Achilles, so we're going to just have to wait and see how effective he can actually be. In terms of the running backs, both of the ineffective runners from last season are back, and actually the only move that the Bucks made at the position was to bring in Giovanni Bernard, who is a pass-catching specialist. So I could actually see the pass-to-run ratio going up even more this season, and considering the awesome offensive line that Brady gets to play behind, I don't really have any concerns that more volume could lead to a higher injury risk for Brady. Now, I don't need to talk about Brady's skills, like everybody knows his accolades as a passer, but I do think it's important to highlight that for as great of a season that Brady had in 2020, uh, finishing as the QB8, he did that in a brand new team after spending two decades with one team, and he came in and he was learning a new offense in a COVID-shortened offseason, throwing to guys like Gronk and AB who were basically coming off the couch to come play with him. So now that he has more familiarity with this offense and the offensive roster has actually improved, I just think the sky's the limit for Brady and I don't see how he could possibly finish outside the top 10. Now I have Brady as my quarterback six, but that's only because he has just a non-existent rushing baseline, so he's not in the conversation for QB1 at all. But that being said, behind Mahomes and Rodgers, he's probably the safest bet to give you top end quarterback production. When you consider his ADP right now, um, I believe he's the ninth quarterback coming off the board, and he's going in the seventh to eighth round, sometimes even later. And for me, that's just way too much value to pass up on. I'm definitely going to be targeting Brady in a lot of drafts this year. So Brady is in a tier of quarterbacks where I'd say he's guaranteed top 10 production, but he's also guaranteed to not be in the QB1 conversation. And another guy I have in this tier is Lamar Jackson. Now, I don't want to make any of the Lamar stands mad here, and I just want to say I'm a huge Lamar fan, you know, big trust, you know, in the flesh, all that. But the truth is that Lamar just doesn't belong in the conversation with Josh Allen and Kyler Murray in terms of being a top, top QB1. Um, he does have next level rushing, the best out of all quarterbacks, but even in like a 2020 season that he just had where he was really successful on the ground, he still only finished as the QB10. And that's because the passing game is just so lacking. So unless he can level up that passing output, he's never going to be my bet to finish as the QB1, even though on a weekly basis, he could always pop off at any time and win you a week. And his rushing output basically inflates his value to the point where it's almost impossible for him to finish a season outside of the top 10. Just for some context, Lamar's passing in 2020 was below average in almost every metric. He ranked 24th in pass attempts, 24th in pass completions, 28th in completion percentage. He was 13th in terms of touchdowns, 22nd in terms of yards, and he did that all while throwing for less than a 3 to 1 touchdown to interception ratio. Every one of those stats were significantly worse than his 2019 breakout season, where he put up respectable passing numbers and paired them with record-setting rushing numbers. In that season, his 3,100 passing yards were not great, um, 22nd amongst quarterbacks, but he led all quarterbacks in touchdown passes with 36, and he did it while throwing for a 6-1 to one touchdown to interception ratio, which was really good. I think it may have been the highest in the league that year, might have been second highest. He took that passing output and he paired it with rushing stats that were just out of this world. He had 176 carries, which is legit workhorse running back workload, and he turned it into 1,200 yards and seven scores on the ground. Now, obviously, those stats led the pack when it came to quarterbacks, but even among running backs, those stats ranked pretty high. Among running backs, his carries ranked 23rd, his yards ranked 6th, and his touchdowns ranked 13th. So what this tells us is that while we know Lamar can explode on the ground at any time, 
in order to finish as the QB1, he needs to do that, and he also needs to pair it with a highly efficient passing performance because the Ravens' offense just doesn't provide that much passing volume. The Ravens have led the league in rushing attempts the past three seasons, and they've also led the league in terms of run-to-pass ratio in the past two seasons. And even when they do pass the ball, the Ravens don't have much to offer in terms of pass catchers besides Mark Andrews. Hollywood Brown showed some promise in a rookie year where he was playing with screws in his foot, but a really disappointing sophomore season made it clear that the Ravens really needed to add a complimentary receiver on the other side. And they tried to do that coming into this season, but the injury bug has bitten that Ravens offense hard. Rookie Rashad Bateman suffered a groin injury in camp, and he's going to miss a lot of time. Newcomer Sammy Watkins has already suffered some kind of undisclosed injury. Um, Hollywood Brown pulled his hamstring, and now his status for week one is uncertain. Uh, Same thing for Miles Boykin. And Mark Andrews recently collapsed and was hospitalized with some kind of complications that some people were saying could be related to him having type 1 diabetes. So with all that, right now as of me recording this in late August, the only objectively healthy pass catchers on the Ravens roster have never caught a pass from Lamar Jackson in their careers. The vibes around the Ravens passing attack are just really ominous right now, so the fact that Lamar is even ranked this high on my list is actually a credit to just how insanely talented he is. So the deck is definitely stacked against him putting up enough of a passing output to complement his insane rushing and deliver another one of those league winning QB1 seasons. That being said, he's still going to always be relevant in terms of a top 10 guy just because of that rushing floor and he's still going to be one of the scariest guys to go up against. And now for the last guy in this leg of my quarterback rankings, the number eight guy who is in the same tier as Tom Brady and Lamar Jackson in that I just don't see how he could possibly finish outside of the top 10, but I don't have him in the conversation for QB1 overall, and that is Russell Wilson. Now, Russell Wilson is kind of an enigma coming into 2021. Like a few of the other guys we've mentioned already, he had a really, really hot start to 2020, but then he fell off hard in the second half. He was actually averaging 29 fantasy points through his first eight games, but then in the back half of the season, he was averaging 16 points, and he only hit the 20-point mark twice in that whole span. And unlike the other guys we talked about, there was no injury that derailed it. The offense just became way less effective in the second half of the year. Even though Wilson did finish as the QB6 in 2020, it didn't feel good to have him on your team because of just how disappointing that second half was, to the point where he was hard to even start at the end of the year. This kind of Jekyll and Hyde season was actually almost an exact repeat of Wilson's 2019 season, where the first half of the year he was averaging 25 points and he had a couple monster games sprinkled in there, but then in the back half he was averaging just over 15 points per game and in that stretch he only hit the 20 point mark one time. Now after that season, there was a lot of talk coming into 2020 of let Russ cook, let Russ cook, and for what it's worth, the Seahawks let Russ cook. He had the most passing attempts that he's ever had in his career, and he also ran the ball more than we'd seen him run it in recent years. However, a lot of that running did happen when Russell was just running for his life behind an offensive line that really struggled at times, and it's hard to say whether they're going to actually be better in 2021. They did bring in guard Gabe Jackson, and he's been serviceable in his career, and he'll be kicking out Damian Lewis from that guard spot. Now, Damian Lewis, who was a rookie last year, was great in run blocking, but really bad in pass blocking. He had only ever played as guard during his college and NFL career, um, up until week 11, where they actually had him fill in on short notice to play center. Apparently, the Seahawks liked what they saw in that performance because now Lewis is going to be the starting center in 2021. Considering that it was already the interior part of the line that was the main problem when it came to pass blocking, and now there's some moving parts there, I wouldn't be surprised if that part of the line struggles to start the season while they build that cohesion that offensive lines really need. Another important factor in 2021 is the new offensive coordinator, since the Seahawks have brought in Shane Waldron. Now, Waldron has never been an OC, and he's never called any plays, except for in a few preseason games, but he has bounced around uh, all kinds of different levels of football, like high school, college, and the pros, at always some kind of offensive position. Most recently, he was on Sean McVay's staff in Los Angeles, where he worked up to the role of passing game coordinator. 
basically he comes to Seattle to try and bring balance to this offense as Pete Carroll came out and said that the team really needs to run the ball more effectively in 2021. Balance was something that the Rams offense had while Waldron was in town. Um, under him, they regularly ranked top 10 in both passing yards and top 10 in rushing yards. Now, can we expect to see that kind of balance in Seattle? I actually think so. The Seahawks do have a pretty good stable of running backs to rotate through in Chris Carson, uh, Rashad Penny, and DJ Dallas. And the offensive line has been a lot better at run blocking than they have been at pass blocking. So I do think that they can lean on the run game more in 2021 to have a better overall offense. But is it going to cost Wilson's fantasy value? Well, a lot of that comes down to a couple of guys that I haven't mentioned yet, and that's the pass catchers on this team. The receiving core is pretty much two guys, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. And both of these guys really don't need high volume in order to be difference makers. They can both take a five yard slant to the house from anywhere on the field. They're both really explosive and the pass game pretty much funnels down to just these two guys and for good reason. I should also mention that the Seahawks did bring in Gerald Everett at the tight end position to complement Will Disley, so I could see them using a two tight end set as their base offense set in 2021. It's something that the Rams did a ton in the past two seasons under Waldron, and it would be a really good way for the Seahawks to be less one-dimensional and less predictable in their play calling, while still keeping their two best playmakers on the outside on the field as much as possible. They should be able to both run and pass out of that set effectively, and Russell should not be running for his life as much. So while yes, I do expect Russell Wilson's passing volume to come down, I expect his efficiency to come back up towards where we're, we've been used to seeing it throughout his career, and I think he'll end up being a lot more consistent than he has been over the past two seasons. Remember, Wilson is a guy who's finished as a top 10 fantasy quarterback in every single season of his career, and nothing that's happened in this offseason makes you think that that's going to change in 2021. Now, I would be really surprised if he somehow managed to finish as the QB1 because the rushing upside just isn't there, but because he's such a lock to finish top 10, and because there's some encouraging signs that say he probably won't be so streaky this season, that's why Russell Wilson lands at number 8 on my rankings. So that will wrap up that tier of guys who I just think are money in the bank, guaranteed top 10, but just don't have the chance to make it to the number one. And that also will wrap up this leg of my rankings. So like I said in the beginning of the video, my next video in this ranking series is going to be the next eight guys, uh, nine through 16. And then I'm gonna finish it up with the final guys, 17 through 24. So if you don't want to miss any of those videos, subscribe to the channel. After I'm done with the quarterbacks, I am going to be doing the tight ends, and then I'm going to finish up with running backs and wide receivers. I want to do them last because I've been seeing so many injuries and changes to the workloads during preseason, so I want to make sure I have a really accurate rankings list going into the start of the year. So with all that being said, that's going to do it for this video. Um, please go into the comments and give me some feedback because this is my first time doing any kind of a rankings video and I could really use the constructive criticism on what I could do better. Alright guys, that's going to do it for me. I will see you guys in the next one.